Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today, let's talk about science and how it affects the flat earth. There are two problems with science and the flat earth. First of all, science respects evidence. And the second is a concept that I want to talk about called scientific congruity. So let's cue up the music and get going. Now in science, congruence means that we can test an object several different ways and end up with the same answer. The answers and the results of the tests are all what we call congruent or agree with each other. This is a very powerful tool for science. So in order to attack the answer, you have to attack all of the ways that give us that same answer and then show that not only are those ways incorrect, but your way is somehow better and answers questions that those other ways cannot. So let's have a look at the radius of the Earth. Now, one of the first ways we determined the size of the Earth was through this work of Eratosthenes. Now, Eratosthenes built upon the work of earlier scientists. They observed that as ships sailed away from port and went off into the distance, their hulls disappeared before the top of their masts did. From that information, they concluded that the surface of the Earth was curved, going downward. Additionally, they looked at lunar eclipses and noted that the shadow of the Earth was always round. The only shape that casts a round shadow from any direction is a sphere. By the time of Eratosthenes, the fact that the Earth was a sphere was pretty well established. The next logical question that they would ask is, well, if it's a sphere, how large is it? So this gentleman, Eratosthenes, developed a method by which he could calculate the circumference of the Earth. And he did it in a rather elegant way. In Syene, or modern-day Aswan, there was a well that on June 21st, the sun shone directly down and it reflected off the water at the bottom. On that same day, he measured the shadow cast by a stick in Alexandria, a surveyed 500 miles north. He found that that shadow was approximately 7 degrees, or about 1 50th of a circle, and he correctly assumed, based on that, that the circumference of the Earth would be about 50 times 500 miles, or 25,000 miles. At about 1000 AD, an Arabic scientist by the name of Al-Biruni used algebra and trigonometry to determine the radius of the Earth directly. What he did was he went up to a high mountain that had a known height and then measured the dip angle using an astrolabe to the horizon. This would form a right triangle. You see that the radius of the Earth is one leg of the triangle. The radius plus the height of the mountain was the hypotenuse of the triangle. And the angles were very easy to calculate. One obviously is a 90 degree angle. The angle at the top of the mountain was 90 degrees minus the dip to the horizon. And the angle at the center of the Earth was the same as the angle of the dip to the horizon. Now, when you look at the radius of the Earth as directly determined by Al Biruni, and when you convert that to a circumference, pi times 2r, it comes up to a number that is very close to the number that Eratosthenes calculated 1300 years earlier. Next, of course, we have a great circle distance between two points on Earth. Now, in order to find a great circle course, what we need to do is we need to know a starting point and an ending point, and we need to cut the Earth in half along a line that would include both the starting and the ending point. To calculate the actual distance between those two points, we need to know the radius of the Earth and the angle between those two points. To do this, we need to know the actual radius of the Earth, or else the distance along that great circle line will not be accurate. Now let's put all of these together and see how congruence comes into play. So with the great circle course, it's a very simple matter of actually measuring the distance along the Earth's surface along this great circle line. 
does it match our calculated distance? Because if our radius is wrong, the physical distance along this great circle course, which we can measure, will not be accurate. So with the great circle course, we can actually measure the distance along the ground. And then the only error that we would have is, is our course correct? Did we maintain our navigation properly? And is our measurement of that distance accurate? How much are those errors and are they significant? Now with the Al Biruni equation, one of the common criticisms that you will hear is that it does not take into account atmospheric refraction. This is a valid argument. Now the next question is, is that error a significant amount? Well, let's go ahead and have a look at that. To evaluate the error rate of the Al Biruni method, what I did was I went to Walter Bislin's advanced earth curve calculator and took several observer heights, one foot, 50 feet, 500 feet, 5,000 feet, and then 50,000 feet and calculated what the error in the distance to the horizon would be versus the geometric horizon. As you see, the error rate at one foot is uh, almost 10%. However, as you go up in height, this drops off rapidly. And at 50,000 feet, it's around 2%. But more importantly, several years ago, the main surveyor calculated the radius of the Earth with observations of a lighthouse off the coast of Maine. On five observations, he measured the drop to the horizon and came up with a radius of the Earth that is within 5% of the accepted radius. So while this is not a perfect method, it does give close agreement to the radius of the Earth as determined from the circumference obtained by Eratosthenes. Now something that is the bread and butter of the flat Earth slash debunking community is these pictures of distant objects being obscured by the horizon. This, of course, is the Willis Tower in Chicago, visible from Lake Michigan. Now, as we go down this, we can actually determine the size and identify these buildings. And you can see them right here. We can identify all of these buildings and how high they are. We can actually figure out how big they would be based on perspective and how much of the building is below the surface of the lake. And the way we do that is using something called the Earth Curve Calculator. We have the curve of the Earth. We have a known observer height. We draw a straight line across the curve of the Earth, and it intersects the distant building at a certain point. Everything above this line will be visible. Everything below it will be hidden. And the way that we do that is rather elegant. It's done after Pythagoras. And under this method, we form two right triangles. Here's one. This leg is the radius of the Earth. The hypotenuse is the radius of the Earth plus the height of the observer. We can easily calculate this distance from the observer to the horizon using the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So if we don't know this number right here, we simply take the square of the hypotenuse minus the square of this leg, and that gives us the square of the distance to the horizon. Once we know that, we know this leg because we know the total distance between the observer and the building. Once we have this value and the radius of the Earth, we can determine this hypotenuse of this triangle and come up with the amount of the building that's hidden here. We can then compare it to what is visible from a known height and a known distance. If we were to determine how much of this building was visible, we'd look at the top of this structure right here. Notice that it comes out a little bit in a step about that distance more down to the horizon. That will give us a very good way to determine how much of that building is visible. We can then compare it to our calculated results. So here's the bottom line. One of the things that you will see in the flat earth a lot is we see too far, uh, the black swan comes to mind, where they claim that since we see more than 1.22 miles, the earth is flat. That's not the case. If the black swan oil rigs were 100 miles away, all we would have would be a larger radius than we expected. So let's just take an extreme case and 
just throw out some enormous numbers to clearly account for any error. The radius of the Earth is approximately 4,000 miles. Let's say that that means that the true radius of the Earth is somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 miles. Now, none of these errors that we've talked about so far will give us a thousand mile error in any event, but let's just do it for the sake of argument. That means that the Earth is a sphere with a radius of between 3,000 and 5,000 miles. In order for the surface of the Earth to be flat, the radius of the Earth would have to be infinite. Even the Sun, which has a diameter of 864,000 miles, more than 109 times the size of the Earth. If you were to stand on the Sun, if that was possible, you would still see a horizon. It may be a hundred miles away, say, but you would see the same type of horizon that we see when looking out from the seashore over the ocean uh, at about three or four miles away. It's just simply a larger sphere, but it is still a sphere. Now this is the great flaw of flat Earth. They're operating under a misunderstood concept of what science is. First of all, you have to accept evidence. It's just as simple as that. The only way that you can disprove evidence is to show that your evidence contradicts it. Second of all, you have to deal with this entire idea of scientific congruency. If, for example, there are four different ways for me to determine the radius of the Earth, and all four come back and demonstrate the same radius. You can't disprove one and say your job's done. You have to disprove all four. The other problem that Flat Earth has is that they seem to misunderstand what their job is. Their job is not to show our measurement of the radius is wrong. Their job is to show that the Earth is flat and does not have a radius or has an infinite radius. If the Earth has a radius, even if it's between three and 5,000 miles, it's still a sphere. And they don't seem to get that. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. I hope that you found that this video was useful. The concept of scientific congruency is an extremely powerful one. And it is very difficult to disprove an entire series of tests that all give you the same answer, much more so than trying to disprove each individual test with a different method coming up with a different answer. Thank you very much. Stop by and hit a like and subscribe on your way out. Remember, we have a Patreon. We also have memberships for the channel. Take care, guys.